Welcome to Way Back When with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy. Welcome to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa, the Big Blend mother daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend magazines. We're so excited to announce that this is the very first of our new Family History Friday radio shows. Every third Friday of every month, Miss Holly T. Hansen, the Gen Teacher and President of Family History Expos, will be joining us here on Big Blend Radio to talk about genealogy, family, uh, family history. It's so exciting. I think this is really great. I know. She is the President of Family History Expos, and they're celebrating 15 years this year, 2018. That's awesome. And it's amazing because she's, you know, presented Family History Expos around the country and now she's doing an expo online, a virtual expo. I mean, you can even click on the expo booths and meet people. It's really neat. That's clever. I know. So uh, the, the expo is called Pirates of the Pedigree 2018 International Family History Expo. And it's held October 15th through 20th, 2018. I encourage you to go register and check out all the exhibitors um, and also all the presenters. This is amazing. Uh, go to her website. It's familyhistoryexpos.com and look under events and you'll find it there. Um, but we're very excited to have Miss Holly here today, our Gen teacher, and also two special guests that will be presenting um, during the conference or the expo, I should say, um, because this is really big. Yes. They go around the world with this. Well, they're pirates. I know. <laughs> but let's get Miss Holly on. Miss Holly, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm wonderful. It's a great day. It's a great day to do genealogy. And um, just looking forward to spending some time with you and your listeners today. It's going to be wonderful. Yes, I'm excited. And you've been in family history and, and being a family history educator for over 20 years now? Yes, I have. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. What got you started into genealogy? Well, you know, when I was a child, my grandmother was very interested in genealogy. I remember her sitting me on um, a card, at a card table. She put her, her Sunday roasting pot upside down on, on a folding chair and slid me up and taught me to type in my first family group record and my first pedigree chart on an old manual typewriter hmm. and I don't know how young I was because that was pretty small to have to sit on a, yeah. a pot to reach the <laughs> to reach the keys <laughs> but I would go with her and and I just loved it from the time I was a child after she passed away um it just became more important to me because that was my link to keeping hmm. her close to me and I you know, I collected things, I researched, I had success, and I'm excited about it. It's so much fun, and I tell everyone, and they'll say, will you show me how? And I, I'm still showing people how after all these years. And it's interesting you said that, uh, you know, you, you typed in your pedigree. Now, I had no idea that I, the name <laughs> of, of your expo, Pirates of the Pedigree, so is that like a clan? I'm, Oh, we are going to learn so much from Miss Holly here. <laughs> I'm loving this already. What is the, you know what? today with the the internet, we're just drowning in a virtual sea of of opportunity of records. People will get online. You see these ads that say it's that easy. You know, just click here, and you don't have to know anything. But there's so much information out there that's good and bad, and there there you don't know how to tell if it's right or wrong. And so the theme, Pirates of the Pedigree, is really a play on word. Don't let the pirates get your treasure. We're going to teach you how to know that your pedigree is correct and and to keep the pirates at bay. We're just going to have some fun with that. So there, you know, there are things out there that will trip you up as you're doing family history research. But if you know about them, you can avoid them. It's like a lighthouse warning you that there's a rocky shore. So that's kind of as you see the, the graphic on our image with Pirates of the Pedigree, we've got, you know, there's the pirate ship and there's the good ship and there's the lighthouse helping us get to our destination safely. We like pirates here now. <laughs> Ahoy, <laughs> yeah, I, I love this. But so the pedigree is your, your, your heritage, right? That is your family lines, right? 
Right. It lists you and your parents and your grandparents and back each generation. A pedigree mm -hmm. is that direct line mm -hmm. of us that you come from. Each generation, it doubles. You know, there's one, there's you. The next generation, there's two, your parents. The next generation, four grandparents. Next generation, eight great grandparents. And that's your pedigree. It moves back in time. Wow. This is so fascinating. I'm so excited. I want to bring our next guest on is Debbie Gertler, and she is a uh, research specialist in Latin America and Southern Europe, uh, and she also works at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And uh, keep up with her at genealogy. Uh, I know you say genealogy. I say genealogy, mm. <laughs> but genealogy nerd on Instagram and Twitter. Welcome, Debbie. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing great. How are you today? Oh, excited to have you on the show and excited that you're going to be presenting, I know, on October 18th uh, as part of the Pirates of the Pedigree Expo. And again, you can go to FamilyHistoryExpos.com and look under events for the information. Uh, but Debbie, I'm very interested because Latin America and Southern Europe, there really is a big tie between the two regions. There is. And, and one of the big ties and one of the reason that, that I feel like I can help with that is because they're all Latin-based languages. And I am fluent in Spanish. And so your Portuguese, your French, Italian, all of that southern le level of Europe is all Latin-based languages. And if you know one really well, you can work research in all the others. And the other similarities that they bear is in, in the types of records that they use because they're all for the most part, predominantly Catholic countries, the, the research methodology is, methodology is very similar as well. Oh, very interesting. Mm. And, and so when, when someone's sitting down to you know, research their family history, do they have to be able to speak Spanish? Uh, or do you just start to kind of learn these are the symbols for you know, this over here? Actually, they can learn as they go. It's helpful to have a little bit of knowledge, but even if they don't have any, there are so many helps out there online now that they could use. But mm -hmm. if they know a little, we can point into some resources that can help them if they get stuck. One mm -hmm. thing they do need to know, though, if their ancestors are from one of those countries, is they need to know the name of the hometown, and that's where oftentimes people get tripped up. They just know, oh, they're from Italy or they're from Spain, but I, they don't know exactly where. So that in that case... A little more mm -hmm. U.S. research is needed. And it's got to be interesting because of the history of Spain. I mean, Spain, it, Spain and England did really good, and, and France going around the world, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but also when you look at the history of the different expeditions, we're based here in Tucson, Arizona, and there's a lot of historic trails and routes that were formed uh, with the Spanish coming up in search of gold and you know, I was talking to a friend on Instagram last night about this, about you coming on and on the show today. And he, he was talking about his family history is definitely connected to South Europe, uh, Spain. And then um, his family came all the way through here to California and Arizona. So it's really interesting, the history. Um, so it, it, it's got to be interesting because you're, you're going to look at, okay, so the family, where are the origins from? But they moved mm -hmm. they migrated. Yeah, and there are some very common migratory patterns that we look at when we're trying to help people and, um, you know, talk about the El Camino Real, the royal highway that mm -hmm. came up from Mexico. And, you know, oftentimes immigrants, they would come into Mexico and then just work their way northward. And so it's just a matter of trying to retrace their steps to figure out where they may have originated from in Spain. But there are some definite patterns that you can look for that can help. Mm. I, I want to bring our next guest on, too, and I think he's going to know a lot about the migration of people, too. Uh, Mr. Paul Ajay, he is from Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, welcome, Paul. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to have you here. And, and so to, today you're actually in, you're in America today, right? Or, or are you contacting yes. us from yes. Ghana? Okay. No, I'm, well, I'm, I'm in the U.S. today. Yeah, next week I'll be in Ghana. Okay, okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know before we uh, started our conversation, uh, we mentioned that Nancy and I, we both lived in Kenya and South Africa. And um, from our experience is that tribes moved around in Africa. And of course, uh, you know, with slavery um, and left the continent. But that's going to be interesting too, trying to connect everybody, especially now. Absolutely. Today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and that's what uh, my company um, that's what my company seeks to do, 
and and that's what we are doing for the last 15 years. Um, through the help of Family Search, we have uh, been going around the continent, helping to connect families and helping mm-hmm. to collect the oral genealogy of the people. Um, and so that is what that's what we are we are very big into it in the continent. Mm. And, and everyone, I, Paul is the CEO at World Biz Business, and I I find this also interesting because, um, you know, I, I grew up as a, as a kid listening to stories, African stories and tales, um, and that's how history was passed down. And I was looking mm-hmm. at what you're speaking at um, at the expo, and uh, everybody again, the expo is Pirates of the Pedigree 2018 International Family History Expo held October 15th through 20th. Go to FamilyHistoryExpos.com and look under the event. Um, and you're going to be presenting on October 16th, uh, my, my Journey, My Story, African Oral History Collection. That has got to be so fascinating. But how do, you even, how do you even start to find the stories? Is it by talking to family members? Yeah, that is, thank, you for, thank you for that question. Um, it's, it's a very interesting um, journey. And, and when I was offered the opportunity to present, I thought that would be a great idea. At the time that Holly and I talked, I was in Nigeria, and uh, my mission in Nigeria was to help set up this project and for us to help connect. Interestingly, I did see a lot of similarities in the culture. As you talked about, Africa is made up of its uh, tribe and mm-hmm. culture. And and anywhere you anywhere you go, you find the similarities. You see that we all are interconnected. Just mm-hmm. as you look at uh, Debbie talked about the records in Southern and Latin America, it's all connected. It what what it means is that we have one big family. We have one big family in 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 um, in Africa or in Ghana, where I come from. We say we have separated from, and um, what we do is to talk to people because um, just for the record, Africa did not. Have Paul, you're going in and for, out a little bit here. Uh, uh, can you repeat your last sentence? You kind of disappeared there. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Is it better? Yes. Okay. Yes, and so, um, I, what I was saying was that. We all know that in Africa, Africa did not have written records when it comes to genealogy. It's really difficult to come by uh, people works that are able to lead you into finding your roots. So mm-hmm. oral genealogy plays a vital role. It's, it's, uh, and at the moment, statistically, when you look at, at the life expectancy in African continent, Average man lives about between the age of 61 years. Mm. Therefore, it shows the need of we helping to gather together this information because mm-hmm. people are passing on each day. And I have a saying that when a person dies or when an elderly person dies, it is more like a library has bent down. Can mm-hmm. we imagine a genealogical group? How many libraries are being burnt down in Africa? Yes. And as we help to bring the world to a global village, it is very important that as we work through this tough period by bringing Africa to the map of genealogy, it is important for us to recognize the need of the history that has, the history has left on burns. And that yeah. is what my company has been involved for the last 15 to 16 years in helping to collect. It's very, very fascinating to me because it also, Debbie, um, this goes into the history that you do as well because when I look at just uh, like the Juan Patista de Anza expedition that came through uh, from Mexico in 1776, part of the 200 plus people that were part of this expedition came from South America. um, And also there were Africans and Afro Latinos. And so there's a huge Mm -hmm. part of that history 
that often doesn't actually get told. I know the National Park Service does a really good job, but it's something that we don't hear about that much. And so do you find those kinds of records? Do you find the African records when, when you're researching, Debbie? So in, in Mexico, I have not personally had a lot of good luck work looking for um, those of African descent in Mexico, but I know that they're, that they exist. I know that I've, yeah, they, in the records, often they will make racial designations as to mm -hmm. what the priest or the, or the scribe thought the person's racial designation was, but it's, it's very hard just to, as in mm -hmm. most of the countries in the world to trace someone with African origins. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, unfortunately, because of the status that they placed on them racially. Yeah, and, it's and, sad. And I was say, um, also, you know, some of our travels, I know we were in Louisiana, um, interviewed a gentleman whose family went from being enslaved to being sharecroppers, um, which at that point I did, it's another form of slavery, I, you know, but yes. um, <laughs> yeah, I just had to might. say that. Yeah. Um, but we met Elvin Shields, and Paul, this was, it, it just took me home back to Africa because he mm -hmm. makes the wire toys. You, you know the little wire cars, you know, that you push as yeah. a kid? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he, he calls them plantation toys. And I'd love to connect you with him because... Oh, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. he, he teaches the kids. He basically... He, we met him at Cane River Creole National Heritage uh, Historical Park, excuse me, on the plantation, one of the two plantations part of this park in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And his home, the sharecropper home that he shared with his family, his brothers and sisters, they were, it was going to get torn down. And um, this is one of our newer parks here. And he saved his, his house. And it's part of the national park. <laughs> this is crazy. But we went and met with him. And he's done recipe books. I think his wife and him have mm -hmm. just now finished a book. I'm getting goosebumps. This is, this is so connected. Um, anyway, so he, we did a video with him. And Holly, I will share this with you too. I'm going to send you the link where he showed how he makes his, what he calls plantation toys. And I was like, well, I grew up with these toys. Because when we lived in Kenya, mm. um, we lived with two different tribes at, at, a, at a specific time. And I'm like, I know how to do this. And I know how to herd cattle too. But anyway, <laughs> he, he, was like, well, he was very excited because we were the first people that knew that he that he connected him to his African but, heritage, and he now he wants to know what tribe he is. And you know, I'm, I'm going. I don't know. Yeah, you know, that's Nancy and I are, so he, hard. How do we know what tribe he's from? Because now he was wondering if the toys come from a specific tribe. Hmm. That would be interesting. You know, that having him do his DNA. That is the all the latest. Um, buzzword yeah. in, yeah. in technology is the DNA may may help him because it'll be far enough back it may pinpoint a more specific region in Africa for him to be able to mm. identify that mm. but yeah fascinating I mean obviously that tradition has passed down through his family for centuries yeah. and and you know tracing the origins of those toys may trace his origins as well well, I know that the the uh, tribes that we stayed with and, and came in contact with all the kids in the different tribes were making the toys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to go back and, and find the specific tribes where it started would be a little bit difficult, yep. but I think it'd be really interesting. Yeah, Paul, because you made them in Ghana too, right? <laughs> yes. I think this is, a, you know, a continental toy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. that is that is that is correct. That is correct. Um, uh, yeah, I love this. I love this conversation. I want to go back to Miss Holly, the Gen teacher. Miss Holly, um, part of the expo does deal with DNA, right? And and because I've heard different things where some people say don't do this DNA test, do that DNA test, and so that can also be confusing. And and this is something that you do cover in the expo, correct? We do. We Our opening keynote is going to have a flair. Bernie Gracie will be talking a little bit about how DNA helped him. It's amazing. He has amazing stories and has been able to learn things that we could not, he couldn't have learned any other way. And, mm -hmm. and so for many people, DNA really does crack the, the code for them to begin to look in a place that they would have had no idea otherwise.
-hmm. I wanted to point out too about Paul. He's very modest in what he does, but he's been averaging, uh, uh, collecting when he does oral histories, about 1.5 million names a year. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I'm I'm astounding. I can't even count to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that was right, uh, Holly, thanks for bringing that up. Um, we, we averagely looking at, um, currently as of, the, as, as of, uh, July, no, June, uh, we had gathered over 800, um, over 800, um, thousand data and, and, and we still counting. What it is is that um, it is important for Africans to acknowledge that it is time for us to preserve our history. Mm-hmm. And um, the good part of it is you have Africa is beginning to uh, breed leaders that understand the importance of what we are doing. And therefore, there's been a huge support from both the locals to the top hierarchy of administration, whether political or local uh, counties, and, and so that has been very, very helpful, and mm-hmm. and and that is where we are achieving our success and our goals from, for connecting um, their ancestors and their roots. Now, I, I wanted to chip in when we talked about the uh, migration from Africa to the um, Mexico and all these other places. I have tried to. A uh, few years ago, I was looking into the uh, some of the the slave trade, those that were taken to Southern America, and it was interesting that there is a city or a town in South America that is called Bantama, and Bantama is a town in Kumasi, in Ghana, West Africa. Now, wow. what that means is that what that means is that there is a strong connection that traces back to where some of these people might have been taken from Mm -hmm. and to be, okay? And so, because, I mean, it's weird. It's not common to hear that. um, And so when I found that out, that was a very intriguing for me. And I was, um, I, I haven't really dived into it deeper, but it tells us that indeed, there is a strong connection between the Africa and the even African American community and places like Brazil, where the slave trade and all of these took um, were one of the, you know, um, landing points for mm. for 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 the migration. Yes, this is fascinating too because when we were in Louisiana. I mean, this was central Louisiana because there, so there's Cajun and Creole culture, and we went to the Creole Heritage Center and learned that Creole was really a, a blend of peoples, you know, in one body <laughs> but connected. <laughs> and I didn't realize that Creole is also in the Caribbean, in South America, Brazil, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. That um, I I was like, wow, you know, I thought this is a certain food type, you know, because it's kind of what is commercialized, you know, and to find out just how diverse with in French, um, the French, uh, English as well. Um, So do you do that as well, Paul? Do you see that kind of like the the islands, the Caribbean islands, and um, do you connect with that in regards to the migration and also um, with the Creole culture? Uh oh, Paul. Oh, I hope he went away there. Hey, I'm here. Oh, okay. There he is. Okay. <laughs> so, so, do you do you work with the different islands? Um, with um, with up uh, currently, currently um, we working with. We just went to Liberia. We just went to oh. Liberia, working with the Liberian people. We went, we are currently in Sierra Leone and Nigeria, some part of Nigeria, which is um, the southern part of Nigeria. And so mm. we, we're working with all different tribal leaders and tri- uh, local authorities in, you know, in helping to achieve the goals that we're achieving. 
Mm, this is amazing what you are doing. Um, Holly, uh, Miss Holly, I wanted to ask too. I feel like I have to put my hand up for Miss mm. Holly. I need my blackboard. Uh, Miss Holly, uh, please can I have a bathroom break? I'm kidding. I just feel like I'm in class now. But um, I, I wanted to ask also because this is an international expo. I mean, uh, so can you give us an overview of some of the other uh, cultures that will be uh, connecting over at the expo? Yes, there will be classes that are going to cover researching in England. Um, there will be classes that are going to talk about archives generally all over, how to access and use archives. We have a presenter that will be teaching us how to begin research for those of descent from India. Um, like we said, we've got DNA things going on. Um, we have Janie Chow, she's a professor in, at Baruch College, the New York City University, and she um, will be teaching Chinese, how to do your family history in Chinese. We've got Norway and Eastern Europe, Ukrainian and Hungarian, um, good old American homesteading stuff. <laughs> Okay. You know, it just it just goes on. We've got uh, colonial migration. This is a very big um, thing that we have that goes on in America. And people come from all over. A lot of people kind of think about England because that's who the war mainly was with. But in that colonial time period, people are coming from, from Germany and France and uh, okay. Jewish people are coming very early in the, in that, that time period besides the the slave trade that's going on and so um, let's mm. see we've got a class that will be learning um, Daniel Horowitz from Israel will be teaching a class we've got uh, Ruth Ellen Manis who worked with me for many many years passed away just a year ago she was probably the world's expert in teaching uh, German and some Scandinavian classes, and we are doing a, a track of all of her classes, many of her classes that they were pre-recorded and we'll be broadcasting those. So we'll have classes going nearly 24 hours a day. Wow. And so some of them will be live and some of them will be pre-recorded depending on the, the presenter. For sure, Ruth's not available. Some of our presenters will not be available in that time period, so we will record their classes ahead, um, but they're coming, and wow. Sweden and Germany and Greek, um, Australia, New Zealand. Wow. This is how, how do you family family search? I know. I feel like that. You are the United <laughs> Nations. I feel like I want to sit for the, the five days. I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to cook a meal per country. <laughs> Enjoy the class and eat that food. <laughs> We should do that. Yeah, Miss Holly, with this, you know, the expo to me, this is such an amazing thing. I know that you did this, um, as, you know, where people would, you know, fly into a city and, you know, and, and mm -hmm. do it, you know, in person. But I think that mm -hmm. what you're doing with this being on the internet is so huge because people can connect from around the world, whereas sometimes they may not be able to fly in and, and take a class. This is something That's that correct. really just goes beyond. And, and I think it's so exciting. Um, will some of the classes be available after after the event? All of the classes for a registered attendee, someone that pays mm -hmm. the fee and registers, they get access indefinitely to those classes. So you can come back and listen to it over and over. And the handouts have anywhere from four to 80 pages for each class. And you have access to download those and print them as a registered attendee. There will be some classes that we offer free that you can just you can join online and watch them, but you will not have access to the handout, and you won't be able to watch it again once it's aired and it's over. That that'll be the only mm -hmm. chance you get. But if you're registered, you have access to all of it at forever. And you I, know, I as long to as give, we're yeah, and 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 the cost of this what it's ninety nine dollars for all five days, and then being able to have the you know access. Afterwards? That's correct, but we actually have an early bird special going on right now if you sign up now for $69. Oh, and when does that end? Mm -hmm. September, sometime in September, I don't. Okay, so everyone, if you go to familyhistoryexpos.com, 
uh, you'll be able to see that and, and, and connect on that because again, this is just incredible. And, and what I find, and I, I wanna ask each of you on this, um, that when you start looking at your history, man, you're, you're, you might need to go to Germany and Scandinavia and then go to Africa and then Brazil because our families, you know, we're, we're global beings and we are connected. I know we touched on that at the beginning. Uh, Paul, I wanted to ask you what, what led you to work in tracing family history and the oral history? Well, thank you very much. Um, what led me to do this project, it's, it's a very, I think, um, genealogy is a passion that it, um, it's, it's something that I'm sure um, it's not an ordinary gift to any ordinary person. You need to be able to have the, the, you know, the ancestors. I believe in that. I was telling, I was telling someone yesterday. I say, you know, I believe in our ancestors uh, around us, and they are always key to see how much we are doing to help preserve them. And and as a young child, um, it all started when I joined on a on a, um, a church. Uh, the LDS Church, where mm -hmm. uh, it's very, um, very focused on this topic or this uh, um, uh, genealogy. And, and when I was introduced to it, instantly I saw the, the, the whole catch of what I was being taught because I had to do my own genealogy. And it was so fascinating that I had to run home and tell my parents about how we can bring everybody to the pedigree and be able to see our family tree. Um, and, and that is how it all started. It started very, very young. And then lo and behold, in around 2002, I was contacted by Family Search at, um, to begin a project in Africa and specifically in Ghana um, to begin to help collect the aura genealogy. Now, it was very helpful uh, when I think about it. It's mo it was more like um, one was either foreordained or one was for, you know, well preferred to engage in this work. Mm -hmm. Because I tell people that we are here to save our ancestors. We are here to preserve what they could not preserve. And that is the key thing about what we do to wow. help preserve what they could not preserve. And so um, that is where I started from. That is where my passion started. And as I grew, when I had the opportunity to mount the stage with Holly in around 2012, it took me to the next stage of my genealogical um, journey. And it's been a progress after progress. Um, in doing, helping to, you know, helping to bring African and um, Africa together in, mm -hmm. in this form. What I tell people, and this is very interesting that I may want to put on the record. Currently, when you go to the continent of Africa, due to the economical hardship and the lack of, um, I mean, the economy or the economical hardships of the people, People are not key in knowing where we come from. Mm -hmm. People are, because people are busy looking for what they can put on the table every day. When you look at how the economies are beginning to transform in um, African continent, there is hope mm -hmm. that in the next 20, 25 to 30 years, the generations that are coming will begin to make use of what we are preserving today. Mm -hmm. Because by then, the economies would have been transformed, and people would love to know where daddy came from, mm -hmm. where grandma came from. But at that point, there wouldn't be any record except the oral history that has been captured as we speak. Yes, And that is I, what I is so fascinating about it. Yes. I, think, I think Africa um, now, because, you know, cell phone technology... Um, has really helped and solar technology has helped and so education is you know as education spreads then you know all this oral history can be captured and i think that is a very it's a very exciting time right now for for all of africa uh to Absolutely. see that growth 
Yeah, Absolutely. it really is. And, and, yeah, and come think of it, um, I, when you look at the African migrant uh, pop, uh, population in the United States, we're looking at over 3 million Africans. And wow. you're looking specifically over to, close to 2.8 million sub-Saharan Africans migrate to, um, I mean, uh, citizens or any form of, you know, residency in America as we mm -hmm. speak. And you can imagine in the next five, 10 years, this population is going to be tripled. And therefore, there is so much need of connecting to, the, to their homeland, connecting to the ancestors in their homeland. And so mm -hmm. it's very exciting. I mean, when you think about what genealogy can do and what we can do with all the technology, we talked about DNA, what DNA can do with right now, what we're doing is um, we, we, there is a pilot project going on about the people that we are interviewing, giving their samples of, um, and so that we'll be able to uh, do DNA and all of that. It's, it's just fascinating. It, it's just awesome. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. This is so exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it, I just, it, it is connecting people. And I think when you know your roots and you can and discover that, um, it, it just adds to your life. But I also think I, I wanted to go back with Debbie on this. Debbie, um, through all the work that you have done and all the teaching you have done and connecting people and getting them started, have you also seen that people are learning the history of the world in, 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 in a way? <laughs> you know, because it's not just your family history. You're learning about what hardships, you know, when when people, you know, maybe – went from here to there, you know, so there's history as well that you're learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that for sure. And especially in the case of those that are, that are immigrating, you know, what was, the, why did they leave? You know, I look at, uh, the, I've been to the Basque country in Northern Spain and it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the Swell Saps. And I think, why did they leave? And as I dig deeper, it goes back into inheritance patterns, but it's, it's fascinating to learn about their lives and the things that they did every day and, and how their history fits in with the history of their locality. People, people are often touched by that when they find out that their ancestor left because war broke out or because they were driven out by some unknown factor. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, people are touched by their history. They, everybody has this deep burning desire to learn who they come from. How am I like my grandparents? How am I like my great grandparents? And what did they do? What did the, what about their life is like mine? And it's important. I think people have that inborn need to want to know about their self and their and their family because it's all in their DNA. It's in their roots. You know, the people who left Europe, especially uh, during World War II or just before World War II broke out, and people immigrated to the states. I know on my father's side that um, when when they, I guess my great grandparents, I'm not sure about my grandfather at this point, but I, their name was changed. Hmm. And I think that makes it a little bit more difficult to research and go back because especially if, if they were from Germany or Hungary, their, their last names were, I guess, simplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a, something that happened a bit, and on my um, my children's lines, they have some Polish ancestors, and interestingly, to watch to trace them back, their name was Patryka when they were in Austria, Poland, but when they came to the U.S., they changed it to Peck, and in my mind, that doesn't sound very similar, but there must have been a reason for it. But the, I was able to track that down by by tracing other members of the family and other relatives that lived there. And I found a wonderful obituary that gave both their Polish name and their U S name. So it's, oh. it's fascinating to see how these changes take place and somewhere there's someone or some record that explains what happened or what might've happened. But it's sometimes it's a matter of looking at every scrap of paper that your ancestor might've created during his lifetime 
to, to mm -hmm. solve that mystery. But it is fascinating how, how they do change it. They try to Americanize. We see that in Hispanics where they will often, they use the double surname system. So the first surname is their paternal father's surname and their second surname is their maternal, um, their mother's surname. And often when they come to the U.S., they'll flip those and put the maternal surname as their middle name. And so it's fascinating how how names can evolve depending on where they come from and where they end up. Wow, this is so exciting. How did you get started in genealogy and tracing family history? So I can trace mine back to a class that I had when I was in high school and we talked about it and I thought this whole thing was fascinating and we found out that several of us in the class were kind of distantly related and I just I caught the wow. bug then and I went off to college and I lived with one grandmother and I went and visited the other and I this I took my this big yellow legal pad with me and I interviewed my grandma and got all this dates and information and just started writing things down and I've been hooked ever since and I, it's been 40 years I think I'm probably wow. dating myself but <laughs> but yeah it's just, it's just it's just that burning desire to know who I am and where I come from and what were my people like and I, I especially love old photos it's just mm. fascinating to me to look into their faces and see, do I have their chin? Do I have their nose? You know, what is it that makes us re related? How, that's just fascinating you, to me. You also lived out of the country for five years, right? Um, in South America? Uh-huh, yeah. And that's actually where I picked up my Spanish. Um, we went and moved down to Chile. and We lived down there for four and a half years while my husband worked in a mining company and I had, a, uh, I had always wanted to learn Spanish. I grew up in Southern Arizona in the mining oh. camp of Clifton and Marinci. And so I wanted yeah, to take oh, Spanish. Wow. Yeah. All my friends were taking French. I'm like, no, I want to take Spanish. I want to know wow. what they're saying. And I want to, I want to be able to speak Spanish. And so, yeah, so we moved to Chile. And while I was down there, I worked in a local family history center and, and help people. Um, one of the first things I did when I got there was to teach some family history classes and my Spanish wasn't too great then, you know, two years of high school doesn't get you very far, but yeah, it was, it was a great opportunity for me to learn more about the research. And so then when it came time for me to finish up my university studies and I had this fluency in Spanish, I thought I'm going to take all the classes on Spanish research as well, because I have a great love for the Latina people and, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be able to help them. And so I took all the Spanish. I've taken several archive trips to Spain. And I just, that's kind of what got me into this, uh, where wow. I am right now. I, you know, it, it's so fascinating that you're our neighbor. <laughs> we're, we're our neighbor uh, uh -huh. in southern Arizona here. And, and being near Marenzi, that's where uh, the famous um, Arizona artist Ted de Grazia comes from, and he's Italian roots. And yes. you think the name de Grazia, and you'll think Spanish. And it's no. so interesting. His family, and he went to Mexico and, and you know, studied under Diego Rivera and Jose, um, Jose Orozco. And his son, Domingo, he, he plays Spanish guitar and got into flamenco and more of the Spanish side, you know, so everyone, you know, thinks they're Spanish, but it's really Italian yes. descent. It's fascinating. It is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, if you, and if you grow up in Marinci, I mean, there's a heavy Hispanic influence there with those that came up from Mexico to work in the mines. Mm -hmm. I have a fun class that I teach on border crossings where I've just picked a family at random out of the census in my hometown and traced them back into Mexico just to show people that it could be done. Wow. Oh, man. I... Okay, so listen, everyone, there's five days of this, of, of you know, world connecting. Uh, this is incredible. Holly, just listening to all three of your stories and just, you've got to be excited for your expo, Miss Holly. I am very excited. <laughs> I'm very excited. I am looking forward to all of the different classes. Yeah. I have a love for um, the cultures of the world and the people that I have met throughout my lifetime. And even if I don't have an ancestor from China, I can hardly wait to hear about it because I will learn so much about the world we live in. And, wow. I, and it just gets me excited in realizing there are people out there who have ancestors from these places that don't know where to start. And, and here we have one spot anywhere in the world you can come. We haven't covered, covered all the countries, but we're planning on doing it annually and we'll pick different places and, the, the things that people really need help with is they let us know what they want to learn. We, we do um, classes all year long online. 
this this is huge because it's not just one class it's actually six days oh yeah that's um, right almost 24 six 24 hours you know we have breaks between each class so it's not just mm -hmm. on top of each other but we have them scheduled around the clock because it's it's you know it's morning somewhere yeah really. when it's night here and i love yeah. that you can you know when you're registered that you can you know watch it again or you know watch it any time so to me i think this is you know really really beneficial for everybody um, again, October 15th through 20th, I told you I can't count, especially, you know, the numbers that Paul's pulling of all the all the oral names and history he's doing. Uh, but October 15th through 20th, 2018, again, I go to familyhistoryexpos.com and just look under events. And while you're there, you'll see all the books and charts you can download and classes. I mean, I, I've been starting to go through this and I'm like, okay. Well, if you're trying to, you know, research military records or the British Isles or this, I mean, it's there. This is like an incredible, incredible resource uh, to, to get you on your way. And uh, I encourage everybody just go again to familyhistoryexpos.com. But before the three of you leave us, which I don't want to, I could sit and talk about this all day long. Um, <laughs> we, we want to play Time Machine. This is our regular question for uh, anybody joining us on our Way Back When show. So Holly, be prepared every month <laughs> for a new, new time machine. The time machine is we, we put you in the time machine and you get to get out anywhere and any time frame. And we want to know where are you getting out. And, and you can go in the future or, the, you know, the past because it's a time machine. Uh, so let's start with you, Paul. Where are you getting out and, and what time frame? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. When are you getting out? Okay, so um, when am I getting up? Can you go to my next um, participant so I can think about my answer and come back to me? Oh, okay, yes. Well, we're going to lock you up in the time machine then for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Debbie, are you ready? <laughs> I think I, I think I am. So I, a lot of my mom's ancestors come from the South. And if you've ever done any research in the United States South, you know that the records sometimes are few and far between. So I would like to go back probably early 18, 1800s, maybe the late 1700s, go into South Carolina, Virginia, mm. and interview my ancestors and figure out where the heck they're from. I, I have some good ideas, but some of those records are kind of sparse. Um, the other mm. thing that I'd like to do related to the South is go talk to, go back in time and talk to General Sherman about why he burned so many courthouses. <laughs> because <laughs> he's a big destroyer of records. And <laughs> I, thought, I know, really, the destroyer really? of records. I mean, how yeah. dare you? I know, isn't that funny how things mm -hmm. like that happen? You always yeah. get, and then you'll find out that what did, yeah, what did he do? <laughs> what did mm -hmm. you do, you know? So there's, yeah. I think, it's so fascinating. There's, There's in, a myriad of other places I'd go, but probably those would be first on my list. <laughs> you, you know, talking about South Carolina, we interviewed a gentleman, Joseph Campbell. And Paul, I want to connect you with him. He, okay. He has a nonprofit, and he is trying to save uh, the different slave dwellings. And this all came mm -hmm. from West Point and Natchitoches, Louisiana. It's mm -hmm. all the same, you know, connections here. But um, anyway, he goes and, and he has um he sets up uh these events where people sleep that sleep overnight in a slave dwelling in a slave house oh, okay. and, and so people understand the what it yep. was like um but yep. also he's he he started in south carolina with this and that's what i'm saying debbie he's he's <laughs> in his own way doing this genealogy thing I don't know, Holly, this is going to get big over these few years of doing these shows with you. We're going to have to start like a, I don't know, a genealogy of all the connections <laughs> that we're doing, you know, already um, of connecting. Well, but, I think um, it's really fascinating um, as we're sitting here talking, my daughter and son-in-law, he works at Maritzi. Uh, uh, he's an operator, oh. a crane operator. And, oh. and so I have no idea about that. Wow. Uh, the world today, so. The world gets smaller it all comes the time. Around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is small. Well, I'm going to send you links and, and emails and, and so everyone can connect with. Uh, and Joseph is, is an incredible man. And I know that through what he's doing, he's documenting families. So I, I think that might be a good connection for you, Paul. Um, and also for you, Debbie, since mm -hmm. South Carolina is part of your family. And he, part of the things are that things get destroyed buildings mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just like you're saying, libraries, courthouses. 
Um, and as people pass on, that's something, you know, that you, like you were saying, Paul, that we lose libraries. And here in Southern Arizona, some of the in interviews we've done um, in regards to the Native American heritage is fascinating oh. too, because of the oral history that number one, because of what has happened with our, our first peoples here in this country, of moving them onto reservations and the schools and everything changing that they did, names. changing their names. Yeah. It's very difficult. Number one, they're mm -hmm. trying very hard to keep their languages alive, but also they're uniting, the different tribes are uniting to make sure that they can remember their history, their language, mm -hmm. and their story, their personal stories. And so this is another, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very, important thing because we're we're getting to that time frame where it could be lost you know mm -hmm. if people don't absolutely it now mm -hmm. and so i find that it's is very, very true. similar very yeah. similar yeah. yeah so you when you think about the language part too you know it's 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 really important um so paul are you ready to to get out of yes. the time machine <laughs> okay. yes um i'll give you I the have... ticket <laughs> <laughs> thank you if, if i have the opportunity um, I am very keen and um, would be very interested to see how we, I can go way back in, in, in slave trade when, when it all started. Uh, there is a great history about how my tribe, uh, my Shanti tribe, were played a vital role during the mm. period. And, and that is something that I'll be interested to see why my ancestors chose to do that. I may not find the answers, but it will be very interesting if I have the capacity to find out why they chose to do what they did. And, mm -hmm. and, but looking back again, you think, I mean, it's genealogy. This was meant to be. This work was meant to be. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to be going. Uh, my time, is, uh, I need to head out. And so um, can, I, can I take a leave right now? Yes, please. Thank you so much for joining okay. us. Okay, thank great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for you Paul. Us. You're welcome. Nice connecting yeah. with you. And and Holly, mm -hmm. we're not we're not forgetting about you. Um, in in the time machine. <laughs> you know what? The, I had the thought come to my mind immediately when you said it, and I want to go back to 1768 in South Carolina. I have an wow. ancestor that I'm, I've been working on very diligently. Uh, people that have used family search and ancestry and my heritage and all these online trees have taken a man by the name of Charles Denham and there's more than one and they've merged him together and I I have been able to separate them out but I, but I'm stuck I need just a little more evidence before I change the information that's on family search and I want to go back there and meet his wife and find out who her father was so I can actually <laughs> Uh, designate that difference. So that's what I'm working on. And I feel like sometimes I'm in a time machine when I go back and read the newspapers and, and all those historical documents. It's a foreign place. The past is a foreign place. And then as I steep myself into those records of the time, I sometimes feel like I'm almost there. It's cr pretty cool. Wow, this is amazing. Debbie, um, Debbie and Holly, um, the time machine says that it'll, it'll take you on a road trip to South Carolina. The two of you can get to go yeah. together. Okay? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one last thing for, for your listeners to think about is, you know, recently the movie Coco was very big with Disney. And I think, you know, our families are just, you know, as soon as we lose memory of them, they're gone. And I, I would hope that people would take the time, talk to grandparents, talk to the elders that are elders that are still living in your family, get their stories, find out what they're all about and, and where you come from. Cause you know, we don't want to lose any, anyone from our memory. That's right. And, you know, I think as, you know, I know right now we're sitting in the middle of summer, but over the holiday season and when you have family vacations together, it should be one of your family activities. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. It Definitely. should really be part of that. And I think this is something that the other thing is when you're, it's a project that connects families, you know, because now families are spread out all over the country and around the world. But this is something a family can, of all ages, kids can get involved, you know, everybody can get in and, and work together on this, right? Holly, this is something that it could, you know, everybody works together. So there's that communication instead of mm -hmm. always like, 
did you get an A on your report card? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, thank it's you. It's very both. fascinating. And we see the youth quite intrigued with it. We, mm -hmm. we really see yeah. them being extremely excited to, yeah, if you could to come use to the, the technology to learn things. Yeah, if you could come into the library on any afternoon during the summer and down on the discovery floor, I mean, it's just a buzz of, of kids, young mm. tweens and teens that are just fascinated by the things they're discovering about their ancestors. I think it's really important yeah. because when you're a teen or a, a preteen, right, you're starting to wonder who you are. You know, you're mm -hmm. developing that, this is me, <laughs> you know, that persona. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think, in, and when you start to go back in your history, you start to make connections and um, sometimes yeah. you may want to change things you know who knows because well, history is interesting there's yeah. still surprises. yes there's always that you know um, so well, I think it's 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 a good thing for them to do you yeah. know? common studies have shown that kids that know their family and know where they come from tend to be more resilient in the face of all that stuff that's going mm -hmm. on in the world the mm -hmm. kids that know their family history and they know, you know, great grandma overcome this to make, to come into the U S mm -hmm. they have that in them and that makes them stronger. Wow. Yeah. Good point. Good point. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much. I, I know Paul had to run and thanks to Paul again uh, for joining us today. We're so excited about this new series with Miss Holly and uh, everybody. I, again, the website is familyhistoryexpos.com. And they're on Facebook and Twitter as well and uh, Instagram. And uh, But the date, again, uh, for the Pirates of the Pedigree 2018 International Family History Expo is October 15th through 20th. Um, the early bird registration uh, goes until September 3rd. Uh, so that's $69. And then otherwise, it's $99. Uh, what a great value when you get to keep all these courses and presentations. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, and now, don't forget, everyone, Big Blend Radio airs. Sunday through Friday, and uh, if you go to bigblendradio.com, you'll see our upcoming schedule. You can listen as shows go live, or you can listen anytime on demand, and uh, we've got a special song to air. We always love to do music, and uh, with Paul joining us, we thought, what a great excuse to play some more of our favorite band, uh, Kwame Benet Shakedown, uh, based out of Harlem. Um, they're going to Europe or to England. That's their next, They're doing another UK tour coming up, so watch for that. Um, but uh, Kwame does come from Ghana, uh, was raised in West London, and uh, has been rocking New York City and Harlem for quite a while. And uh, you can go to Kwame Benet, shakedown.com. But we're going to play a song that really um, ties together everything we've been talking about today, about how the world is small, how we're all connected in some way. And uh, genealogy obviously does that. Uh, this is called Universal Love. It was written by Jimmy Cliff. Um, and Vernon Reed worked with Kwame on this, and it's from their latest album, Roots, Rock, and Universal Love. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us with you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Here it is, everyone. Universal Love.
your tribal boundaries all day Within your political boundaries all day Yes, within your 